it brings me to uh, two slides that will, uh, that will end this discussion. So the first one is rethinking water treatment. If we think about sewage, the, the, the strange thing about sewage is the average human being excretes about 0 0.03 gallons of feces a day. We also generate somewhere between 0.5 to 1 gallon of urine. These are the sources of waste, the major sources of waste at a household level. So in the United States, the average um, sewage generated per person is about 100 gallons of sewage per day. And what we're basically doing is we're taking one gallon, combined gallon of waste from urine and feces, and then we're diluting that with 99 gallons of what is arguably almost clean water from flush, from wash waters, and that's what we're sending to these big treatment plants. So if I was going to rethink how to do sewage treatment, uh, and we've done that because that's just the way we've always done it, you know, so we use almost, you know, almost four gallons, sometimes anywhere between one to four gallons per flush. Uh, we take these long showers, you're only washing yourself for maybe one minute, but the shower is on for 10 minutes and all that water is wasted. Uh, we're doing laundry and we're using almost 50 times the amount of water that's going to be required in these laundry systems and machines. So if we were rethinking how we fundamentally did water treatment, um, maybe we don't need to have this dilution because what this dilution does is it, it, it turns something that should be a high solid stream that, you know, so if we think about sludge age or hydraulic retention time, the, the volume I need to hydraulically retain 0 0.03 gallons or one gallon, right? If I need one day of hydraulic retention time, now I'm forcing myself to have a hundred times the volume that I need to have a one day hydraulic retention time because I have diluted the stuff by almost a hundred times. Now, there are some advantages to the dilution. It makes it a little easier to move. Uh, it might, but it makes it also less concentrated. So from a mass transfer perspective, my concentrations are lower when I've done all this dilution versus where I have this more concentrated system. So could we actually do source separation? Could we reduce how much we're diluting this waste by? Could we take some of these fecal waste, which is small volume, um, at the household level, use things like anaerobic digestion to stabilize that waste, generate some biogas, even at the household level, maybe use it for a little bit of cooking uh, or some minimal energy provision, and then take the stabilized fertilizer and use that at some level uh, for crops. Could we take the urinal waste? 75% of the nitrogen we're concerned about comes from urine. So could we take that urinal waste, separate it, uh, not mix it in with everything else? Because that's the complication. That's one of the reasons why our treatment plants need to be bigger and bigger, because we're trying to do nitrification and denitrification. Uh, the urine itself, if it's stabilized, can be a very rich source of liquid fertilizer. Um, and then could we take this relatively clean water from wash waters and dishwashers and things like that, and just do some minimal treatment at a household level and utilize it as gray water? Could we take that stuff and use it to flush toilets rather than clean water that, as, a, as, a, as a flush? So these are some things that can be done. Um, I've actually been fortunate to be involved in a number of projects um, almost 20 years ago now where in Brazil, where um, we were providing these types of services to high-rise buildings where we were taking their, their wastewater, uh, treating it in the basement using membrane bioreactors and then taking the water generated from that. And that was what was used in their flush systems. So they didn't use clean water to flush. They used this recycled water from their own treatment systems uh, for, for flush water. So that's one way to think about it. The other fundamental paradigm shift um, that, I, that I think we also need to consider is, is that 
should we even be talking about waste treatment? You know, I, I, I argue that our wastewater treatment plants should be biorefineries, right? You know, we started with treatment. The goal initially was just let's clean the water. And then there was this move in the 1990s to, you know, to the early 2000s that was focused around, we know there's a water energy nexus. We know that somewhere between two to 4% of all the energy used in a municipality is for just pumping water. You pump the water to a wastewater treatment plant. You, you pump the water from a drinking, drinking water treatment plant. We're just pumping all this stuff and it's almost 4% of all the energy we utilize. Do we need to do that? Can we rethink the way that we do it? Uh, and then we have all these richness in, in waste that we're struggling to deal with. But the reality is it's immensely rich. We complain that we don't have enough phosphorus in the world, but there's enough phosphorus locked up in our feces that we may not need to actually mine new phosphorus ever. Um, we have enough gold falling you know, in the feces that if we had ways of being able to to extract those materials, there's so much, you know, that we could mine from sewage. And so if we reimagined what the treatment of the future could be like, could we have wastewater treatment systems that actually don't need, and the, the effluent from the wastewater treatment plant is what feeds our drinking water treatment plant because there's no need for us to be pumping wastewater and put out almost clean, right? Almost clean water. In some cases, the effluent from a wastewater plant is actually cleaner than the source water we're taking from a river or lake to a drinking water plant. Could we do that um, with some additional treatment, obviously, to remove any remaining contaminants of concern? Could we, um, could we take uh, leverage anaerobic digestion as much as possible? reduce the dilution factor so we can have smaller, more compact reactors. So we're generating energy, we're taking the nutrients that are generated, the digested, uh, the digested, and we're turning that into organic fertilizer. Um, these are possibilities that we can actually explore. Could we take the CO2 that is generated from the treatment processes and then leverage that CO2 and utilize it in methanotropic or methylotropic uh, systems that can take CO2 and methane and turn that into bioplastics. These are possibilities that, that, that can actually be explored. And so um, I, I, right now I'm spending a lot of my time trying to explore those possibilities. Um, and I, I think there are six challenges that we need to address as we think about this new age possibility. Uh, the first one is, the biggest challenge we have is these biosolids are, they are rich, they are nutrient rich, they are carbon rich, but they are not soluble. So how do we access that carbon? Uh, we, need to, we need to lyse the cells. We need to blow the cells open. We need, to, uh, we need to get into the COD that's locked up in these cells, in this cellulosic uh, or lignocellulosic material, in, this, uh, in the biosolids. Um, you know, how do we access that? We need new lysis methods to be able to do that. Um, how do we enhance the cost and the efficiency of digestion? We use about 20 to 30 days to do digestion. That's, that's, it's inefficient. And after doing digestion for 20 to 30 days, you're lucky if you have actual 50% conversion of the carbon locked in the digester because it can be a very difficult process to the solid concentrations are so high that the there's significant mass transfer limitations. So how do we boost that process? Uh, that's also something that we need to, we need to unlock. Um, we have all these possibilities to utilize algae for CO2 capture. Uh, struvite right now, anybody who runs digesters, it's a nuisance. We're generating all this struvite, but this stuff is actually rich in nitrogen and phosphorus. How do we optimize those systems so that these nuisance materials that are now impediments to efficiency can actually become products that we generate? Um, how do we do things like methanotropy? How do we take products like methane, products like CO2, that right now in some cases are wastes, they are flared, how can we take them and turn them into bioplastics? How can we turn them into uh, new biofuel sources? Uh, we know this is possible. We're doing this at a pilot and lab scale. But how then, it leads me to point number five, is how do we create business models 
that allow us to take all these possibilities that we're playing around with on spreadsheets and turn them into viable things that we can actually, that can be sold, that can stand alone as businesses and solutions that we can bring to the table. And then how do we create partnerships that take some of these new materials that we're generating, the single cell organisms that we're using with CO2 to generate, um, how can we turn them into things like animal feed proteins and things like that? And the good news is there are actually companies that are starting to emerge that are actually beginning to do this. So we have companies like Mango Materials that is taking animal feed proteins manufactured from CO2, and they're using that to replace uh, proteinaceous material in animal feed. Uh, we have companies like Unibio that are taking, that are using algae to generate uh, bioplastics, uh, PHAs and PH, uh, PHBs uh, that are starting to replace the use of fossil fuel based plastics. Uh, all of these are still in their infancy, but I believe that the next phase of growth uh, is us beginning to think of not wastewater treatment, but actually biorefining the treatment system as a biorefining unit where we're generating energy and we're generating products. In conclusion, um, what I've learned in, in, in my uh, two plus decades in, the, in, in this industry is that biology is remarkably efficient and cost-effective. Um, and that if we understand biology and we understand microbes and we understand the limitations of these treatment systems and don't try to force them to do more than they're supposed to do by engineering them to be even bigger and more and more monstrous that just understanding that simple biology can help us be much more efficient can help us um, understand what we can't change and then leverage what we have to be able to address the goals and the targets that we want um, i've also learned we need new tools um, genomics is something, you know, when I started in the business, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we weren't using DNA analysis. We, we didn't even talk about the differences in the types of microbes. Uh, now it's routine. There's no plant I would go to today where the first, one of the first things I'm doing is not a genomic analysis to really understand what microbes are present and to understand why we're seeing the type of things that we're seeing. Um, and then the last two things I, 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 I would, I would close with is the fact that, um, as you know, I come from Nigeria, it's a developing economy. Um, India is also uh, in a, in a, is also developing. There are, and as we continue to think about, as we continue to build new treatment systems, I think we have the advantage of, of leapfrogging some of the things that the developed world, that folks like the US and others did. They, started doing carbon removal and then found out over time that they start they needed to do things like nutrient removal it was a and so their plants evolved to deal with that i think the advantage that the developing economies have is we know what all these problems are so we can sit down and we can optimize and think about what the best solutions are as we bring those solutions to the table Decentralization makes sense. We have to rethink the way we imagine plumbing in a house. We have to stop this process of using clean water to, to, to move bad. Uh, we have to think about decentralized treatment, even at the household level, as a fundamental part of how we think about building facilities. Uh, and then we also have to think about, I think, the notion that treatment plants are not waste treatment plants, that they are actually biorefineries where we can generate materials, we can generate energy, we can clean uh, the water for sure, uh, but it's not, it's not a waste treatment system. It's actually a biorefinery system where we're generating high value products. Um, so thank you very much. I, I apologize if I had uh, you know, significantly exceeded the time that, uh, that was given to me, but uh, uh, so apologies for that. <laughs> you, you